Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Almighty God, to you all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have given your only Son to be for us a sacrifice for sin and also an example of godly life. Give us grace to receive thankfully the fruits of his redeeming work and to follow daily in the blessed steps of his most holy life. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. A reading from the book of Jeremiah. Am I a God nearby, says the Lord, and not a God far off? Who can hide in secret places so that I cannot see them, says the Lord. Do I not fill heaven and earth, says the Lord. I have heard what the prophets have said who prophesy lies in my name, saying, I have dreamed, I have dreamed. How long? Will the hearts of the prophets ever turn back? Those who prophesy lies and who prophesy the deceit of their own heart? They plan to make my people forget my name by their dreams that they tell one another. Just as their ancestors forgot my name for Baal. Let the prophet who has a dream tell the dream, but let the one who has my word speak my word faithfully. What has straw in common with wheat, says the Lord? Is not my word like fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaks a rock in pieces? The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please join me in reading Psalm 82 responsively by the whole verse. God takes his stand in the council of heaven. He gives judgment in the midst of the gods. Save the weak and the orphan. 
Defend the humble and needy. They do not know, neither do they understand. They go about in darkness. All the foundations of the earth are shaken. Nevertheless, you shall die like mortals and fall like any prince. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. By faith the people passed through the Red Sea as if it were dry land, but when the Egyptians attempted to do so, they were drowned. By faith the walls of Jericho fell after they had been encircled for seven days. By faith Rahab the prostitute did not perish with those who were disobedient because she had received the spies in peace. And what more should I say? For times would fail me to tell you of Gideon, Barak, Samson, Jephthah, of David and Samuel and the prophets, who through faith conquered kingdoms, administered justice, obtained promises, shut the mouths of lions, quenched raging fires, escaped the edge of the sword, won strength out of weakness, became mighty in war, put foreign armies to flight. Women received their dead by resurrection. Others were tortured, refusing to accept release in order to obtain a better resurrection. Others suffered mocking and flogging and even chains and imprisonment. They were stoned to death. They were sawn in two. They were killed by the sword. They went about in skins of sheep and goats destitute, persecuted, tormented, of whom the world was not worthy. They wandered in deserts and mountains and in caves and holes in the ground. Yet all these, though they were commended for their faith, did not receive what was promised, since God had provided something better so that they would not, apart from us, be made perfect. Therefore, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, Let us also lay aside every weight and the sin that clings so closely, and let us run with perseverance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to Luke. Jesus said, I came to bring fire to the earth, and how I wish it were already kindled. I have a baptism with which to be baptized, and what stress I am under until it is completed. Do you think that I have come to bring peace to the earth? No, I tell you, but rather division. From now on, five in one household will be divided, three against two, and two against three. They will be divided. Father against son, and son against father. Mother against daughter, and daughter against mother. mother Mother-in-law against her daughter-in-law and a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. He also said to the crowds, when you see a cloud rising in the west, you immediately say, it is going to rain, and so it happens. And when you see the south wind blowing, you say, there will be scorching heat, and it happens. You hypocrites, you know how to interpret the appearance of earth and sky, But why do you not know how to interpret the present time? The Gospel of the Lord. Praise you, Lord Christ. Please be seated, and would any of the children like to join me for just a minute up here? Morning. Good morning. How's it going? Good. Good. Some of us are back in school. Some of us are starting this week. How, how are we feeling about all that? That good? Eh, not, eh, not the best. All right. That's cool. That's, that's honest. I like it. Um, Teacher was sick for the first week of school. All right. Well, that's the yeah. That's a that's a thing that happens. That's. So here's a here's a question. What is your favorite sport to watch? Does anybody have a favorite sport to watch? Baseball. Baseball. Soccer. Soccer. I kind of am into like basketball. Basketball. Baseball. Baseball. Gymnastics. Gymnastics. Do you have a favorite sport to watch? No. Yeah, yeah, I'm aware. Whatever we're forcing you to watch at the moment is your favorite to watch, I guess. So um, it's fun to be part of the crowd at a sport. So I, have you ever done the wave? You remember the, have anybody done the wave at a sporting event? Anybody familiar with this? Have you seen it? It looks really cool. You've been part of the wave? Okay. That sounds, okay. So the wave is everybody, you know, you, you get up and, and you wave, right? And I don't know why, but it's just the thing you do. I don't know who started it. I, I, I have no idea about the history of it, but it's a thing that you do. So one time I was at a, uh, at a game. This is a very important football game in Jaguars history, um, by the way. Um, and we, we needed to win a game to get into the playoffs, right? So that's really important. And uh, it turned out uh, it was against the Atlanta Falcons. I remember this very clearly. Um, And Morton Anderson was a great kicker, right? So they get down to the other side. So I'm sitting on this side of the field. They're sitting on that side of the, they're on that side of the field. And all that has to happen is Morton Anderson has to make a field goal. All right, not that hard for him. He was really, really good. And he goes to kick it and he slips as he's going to kick it. And it just missed, It just went that way. And I remember, because I was on this side of the stadium, and I remember seeing, like, it looked like the wave, but people realized kind of he had missed it, and it came around all the way to where I was sitting until the whole stadium realized he'd missed the field goal. We were going crazy. We went to the playoffs. It was a lot of fun. It was a good time to be a Jaguar fan. It's been a while. I think the last time it was a good time to be a... So why I'm saying that is because I wanted to talk about the Jaguars. But the other reason I'm saying that is because... uh, Hebrews, the book of Hebrews used an interesting phrase that I really like in the book of Hebrews today. 
um, the writer, and we don't know who wrote Hebrews. That's kind of interesting. Just the Hebrews. So whoever wrote it said that we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. So have any of you ever played sports and heard people cheering for you? What does that feel when you hear people cheering? It feels good. It feels good? Makes you play better, better kind of lifts you up a little bit. What do you think about people cheering? You do play sports even if you don't enjoy watching them. So lacrosse, it feels good when you're out there on the field and people are cheering for you. Yes, it feels good. So uh, I'm not getting a lot out of my daughter today from children's sermons. It's what happens sometimes. Um, when, we're, when we are lifted up by those that are cheering for us, I think that is a little bit what the author of Hebrews is talking about when he says we're surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. And I was thinking about how I was at that game and watching the crowd sort of come around and cheer for the team. How good that must have felt, unless you were Morton Anderson, in which case it did not feel good. But if you were on the other team, it felt really good to just have these people surrounding you with their cheers. Or when you're playing sports, you hear people surrounding you with your cheers. And what the author of Hebrews says is that's sort of what the saints are like. The saints are those who kind of cheer us along as we seek to follow Jesus. So I talk about this a lot, but you're not alone as you're seeking to follow Jesus in this new school year. You're not alone. You've got all of us here. We're kind of saints sometimes who surround you and want to lift you up in what you're doing and the ways you want to love others and the ways you want to serve others and follow Jesus. But you also have the great cloud of witnesses, which are the saints that we don't see anymore. There's lots of saints who we do not see any longer because they have gone on to life with God. And so those surround you as though they're doing the wave, coming around you, cheering on, cheering you on as you live and follow Jesus in whatever you are doing. So that's a lot of different ideas. But as I was heard that, a great cloud of witnesses. That's like the saints who are cheering us on. So as you go this year, do the best you can. Follow Jesus with everything you have. Say you're sorry when you need to say you're sorry and keep going and know that you are not alone. You have us and you have a great cloud of witnesses that you cannot even see who are there for you and cheering you on. Amen. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So I think that most of y'all know that before I went to seminary, I served as a youth minister. And it was a wonderful time in life. I love the work that I got to do. One of the highlights of my time as a youth minister was a chance I had to take a group of our 10th and 11th graders on pilgrimage. And so we were taking them on pilgrimage on the summer before they were going to be confirmed that fall. And the idea that we were using was sort of a cathedral to cathedral pilgrimage because we were from the cathedral in Jacksonville and we had lined up a couple of cathedral stops along the way. So we were going to go to Washington National Cathedral, which I suspect many of y'all have been in, a really beautiful building. And we also, another beautiful building that we stopped in was St. Paul's Cathedral, which is in Boston. So that it was kind of, we were going from one cathedral, stopping at these two other cathedrals. And one of my goals on the trip was to give our youth, most of whom had grown up Episcopalian, a a taste of the ways that other Christians worshipped. So we attended some worship services along the way in churches of various denominations, but I also wanted them to get a sense that worship within the Episcopal church actually had a lot more variety than they were used to. I mean, we went to this very kind of, very formal kind of church and not everybody worships exactly that formal kind of way even within the Episcopal church. Now y'all know me I would never be accused of being someone who's really into liturgical experimentation that is just not my sort of thing I'm pretty by the prayer book kind of guy I love our very normal way of Anglican worship right That said, I am also aware that within the Episcopal Church, within the Anglican world, there's lots of variety, and that's okay, even if it pains me to say it. It's okay that there is some variety. And I thought, if these folks are going to be confirmed, they should at least understand that the Episcopal Church is a bit broader than maybe they have realized. So I planned for us to attend some worship services that had alternative approaches to the liturgy. 
Specifically, we attended a service at St. Paul's Cathedral in Boston called The Crossing. I actually looked this up this year. It's still meeting. They still have this service, and it still meets on Thursday evenings. I don't know about the format, but the format when we went included a jazz band, which was good, seating in the round. So rather than sitting out in the pews, you kind of sat around some on the floor. It was scandalous. Um, around the altar. Um, there was a very brief sermon, which I don't think anyone ever has complained about. Um, and then after the sermon, folks were given multiple ways to respond to the sermon. So you could join a conversation group out in the narthex who were going to talk about the sermon. You could come up front and there was a table set up. You could draw a picture um, to respond to the sermon. You could sit in silence while you listen to the jazz band play and reflect, to, you know, listening that way. Um, you could pick up some prayer beads. They had a prayer bead station. You could pick and say, you know, the, the rosary or something like that. It was like, it was like a choose your own adventure for the liturgy. Um, so it was, that was the thing. And then communion came. So the, the prayer before communion, the Eucharistic prayer, was totally different than anything I'd ever heard or ever heard since. The priest actually sang the whole thing. So we sing parts of the Eucharistic prayer. She sang the whole thing. She had a really nice voice, so it worked. But she sang the whole thing, and it was kind of a call and response. The jazz band was playing, and she was singing parts of the prayer. Not something we're going to try here for kickoff Sunday next week, don't worry. But that was sort of how it, it went. Um, and then after commu for communion, rather than coming to the rail or something, everybody just stood in a circle, and you communed the person next to you, and it was... It was a little awkward, I remember that, because you can't, you got to do, and then you got to get the wine. And anyway, there was that. And then it closed with more jazz. People actually got up and danced. Again, not something we're going to do for kickoff Sunday. So, I mean, it was weird, okay? It was, it was weird. Even for someone who tends to be by the book, though, I still thought that was kind of cool, you know? Not what I'd want to do every Sunday morning, not anything I would ever try to introduce to St. Peter's, but it was okay. Um... And I thought maybe that the youth group that I had took would feel the same way. So we get back to our hostel that we're staying at for our nighttime reflection. So what did y'all think? And the bloodbath began. They hated every single thing about it. They hated the seating arrangement. They thought that the music was terrible. They did not like the sermon. And they really didn't like responding to the sermon in all these weird ways. They could not, they really complained about giving each other communion. I remember that was a big stick, sticking point. They thought it was all absolutely terrible. And my only response that I could give was, well, y'all are going to make great Episcopalians because you're only teenagers and you're already saying we've always done it this way. So I will say two of those youth are now serving in ministry, one as a priest, and then another of them is actually in the discernment process to become a priest. So I think we did some things right, right? They were paying attention, um, but they were reflecting something, something that we all feel, sometimes about little trivial things and sometimes about big gut-wrenching, earth-changing things, and that is a resistance to change, even those among us who are the most flexible and resilient have our limits. So some of us in this community are feeling the sting of change right as we speak. Some have dropped off kids at college just this past week or in recent weeks. Some are going through changes in their job. Some are mourning the fact that after a number of years of lugging both your children to school every morning, one is now going to go in a different direction. Not to speak too much for my own personal struggles at the moment. At its best, change can make life feel fresh and new. But even in that, there is some residue of mourning. There's some sadness about what is no more, of wondering whether the change we made was the right one, of second-guessing ourselves. At its worst, it's not nearly so fun. Change can feel like something has been foisted upon us completely outside the realm of our control. And while the truth is most of life is actually always outside of our control, change can make us really feel it in a sort of visceral way. We're always not really in control, but a new diagnosis, a loss of a job, a change of place that uproots us, those sort of things make us really feel it. And maybe all of that is why Jesus seems a little bit grumpy in this morning's gospel. Because ultimately the topic that he is addressing this morning is the topic of change. So I know 
we kind of expect Jesus meek and mild and gentle. And when he says things like he says in this morning's gospel, it makes us a little bit confused. But behind the fiery words that Jesus is giving us is a message about change. I came to bring fire to the earth, he says, and how I wish it were already kindled. He then goes on to talk about division, how his way will lead to divisions in even the most fundamental of units, the family. But I want to be clear, Jesus is not anti-family. He loved his family. Think of the way that he ends his life. The last, one of the last things he does is to make sure his mother is cared for in his absence. So he's not here commanding us to abandon our previous relationships and count them as nothing. Instead, he's letting us know he is bringing a change. Think of what a wildfire, which is what Jesus says he's coming to bring. Think about what it does. It changes things. Yes, it's destructive, but what comes in the wake of the wildfire? New life comes out of a wildfire. A friend of mine is a trail runner, and he goes to Montana every spring to run. And a few years ago, his favorite trail was victimized by a fire that came through. But when he returned this year, something amazing had happened. The land which had been so desolate right after the fire had been made completely new. New growth had sprung up even more lovely and plentiful than before. The fire had scorched the old things, but it had also let new beauty flourish. And I think that's the sort of fire, sort of change Jesus has come to bring. Not one that leaves us desolate, but one that invites us to a new way of being, a new way of living, a new way of one completely reshaped by his death and resurrection. And yeah, that new way requires change. Our encounters with the risen Lord, our encounters with Jesus cannot leave us unchanged. So if your faith has never demanded something like that of you, if you've never been stretched or never grown, if you've never had to reevaluate your choices and your priorities based on your encounter with Jesus, you might need to ask some questions about whether you are allowing Jesus to shape you or whether you are, and this is really tempting because it is really easy to just want to shape Jesus into who I think he should be. And if our faith has never invited us to change, the chances are we're wanting a Jesus made in our image rather than for us to be remade in the image of him. And I'm not talking about the old boring sins that are obvious. We all have those Every single one of you, sorry about it. We all struggle and we all need to change those. Of course we do. I'm talking about the deeper stuff, the fundamental stuff, the ways we understand who we are often need to change in light of who Jesus is. That's what Jesus is getting at with his language about family. Because family tells us something about our identity, something about who we think we are deep down. What are other things that do that? What are other things that give us our core sense of who I am? Am I primarily letting the channel I get my news from give me my identity? I'm afraid that some of us are. Am I letting the way that I tend to vote tell me this is who you are? Or maybe I'm defining myself by what I'm against. I'm not one of those. We do this as Episcopalians, y'all. I'm not one of those kind of Christians. Are we doing that? Are we content to let that be telling us who we are? Or am I going to primarily find my identity, find who I am, find what makes me me in the fact that I am a disciple of the risen Jesus? Our question to that, our answer to that question might need to change. What title are you wearing this morning that Jesus might be ready to bring fire on so that you can be the person you are truly called to be at your core, which is a disciple of the risen Lord, a baptized citizen of God's kingdom, one called to be the presence of Jesus in your very ordinary everyday life. What if I told you, though, that Jesus' words about fire are actually even worse than they sound in today's gospel, even more extreme than the way they sound. Because our translation says 
that Jesus says, I have come to bring fire to the earth. But the Greek is actually a little bit more, ratchets it up just a little bit. In the Greek, Jesus says, I have come to throw fire on the earth, which in line with my comments about Marvel movies last week reminds me of like somebody shooting fire out of their hands. Sermon for another day. But this is Luke's gospel. And Luke wrote another book of the Bible, which is the book of Acts. And in Acts, fire is thrown on the earth, the fire of the Holy Spirit, which rests on the disciples on the day of Pentecost. The fire Jesus wants to bring to us, to throw on us, to change us and reshape us is nothing less than the life-giving fire of the Holy Spirit. The Spirit descends as fire on the disciples at Pentecost. And it is that Spirit that empowers them to do something new. To do things they never thought they'd be able to. To speak in new languages. To follow Jesus wherever He called them. To live in daring and courageous and bold ways. The kind of people who have courage and boldness to decide to follow Jesus, even when it costs something, are people who have been set on fire by the Holy Spirit. And St. Peter's, that is what we are called to be. At every baptism we do at that font back there, we invoke the Spirit's presence and power in the life of the newly baptized. We take oil and we put it on their forehead and we say, you are sealed by the Holy Spirit in baptism and marked as Christ's own forever. That is what we tell the newly baptized person. And we are all reminded... Every time we do a baptism, that that identity isn't just for the newly baptized. It is for all of us. All of us are sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked as Christ's own. If we wish to follow Jesus, we cannot push that call aside. We are the ones called to change. We are the ones called to reorient our lives around the good news of Jesus. We are the ones called to live like a people set on fire. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, the eternal God of the Father, God of God, light of light, through God, 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 through The prayers of the people. In peace we pray to you, Lord God. For all people in their daily life and work. For this community, the nation, and the world. 
for the just and proper use of your creation. For all who are in danger, sorrow, or any kind of trouble. For the peace and unity of the Church of God. For Justin, Archbishop of Canterbury, Michael, our presiding bishop, Brian, our bishop, and for all other bishops and other ministers. For the special needs and concerns of this congregation. Hear us, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for all the blessings of this life. We will exalt you, O God, our King. Remembering especially Philip Morris, Judy Nevitt, and Ruth Seiler, we pray for all who have died and that they may have a place in your eternal kingdom. Lord, let your loving kindness be upon them. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us for our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone, and so uphold us by your Spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to honor and glorify your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. The peace of the Lord be always with you. morning. So good to be with y'all this morning. Uh, good to be with y'all in air conditioning this morning. It feels much nicer. Yeah. Yes. Uh, if you see Gerald Motley, who is our facilities director, give him a big hug because uh, he has uh, done a lot of work to make sure that we could be back in cooler temperatures. Uh, so that we are very thankful for that. Um, couple of announcements about things coming up. This afternoon, we will have the backpack blessing here um, at four o'clock. So we'll have that. We'll bless backpacks. But if you've got another bag you want to bring, we'll bless that too. And uh, we'll have popsicles afterwards. So we'd love for y'all to come and join us and be part of that this afternoon at four. Uh, next Sunday is our kind of fall kickoff Sunday. So we've got a lot of great things planned. Um, we will have lunch together after this service, and that'll be outside. Uh, we'll have tents and things like that. Um, we will provide kind of the main course. So we're just asking y'all to bring sides or desserts to share. Um, we'll have, you know, some Sprites and Cokes and waters. If you would like to bring alternative beverages to that, you are welcome to bring that if you, if you feel so called. Um, that will be, again, after church, after the 1030 service next Sunday. On the 27th, we will have lector and intercessor training. That's a Saturday morning, around 10 o'clock. We will have, uh, we haven't settled on the time of that. Don't mark down 10 o'clock yet. But on sa Saturday morning, we'll have lector and intercessor training. If you would like to join us in ministry by reading the lessons or joining in the prayers on Sundays. So that will be on the 27th. And then 
finally, our Sunday school year will kick off on the 28th. We'll have options for children, youth, as well as a couple of options for adults. I will be teaching a class um, that we're going to call St. Peter's 101. So if you want to be confirmed, that's a great class to come for that. Um, it'll be at the 9.30 hour, uh, I think last about five weeks. I need to look at my calendar exactly. But uh, that will be at the 9.30 hour starting on August 28th. And if you are kind of 16 years old or older and are interested in being confirmed when the bishop comes in January, would love for you to be part of that class. Or if you're new to this community, new to the Episcopal Church, and you kind of want to just get your bearings while you're settling in, that's also a good reason to come to that class. So lots of exciting things coming up. Uh, we are going to be praying special prayers for our students uh, who both began school this past week and will begin school this coming week. But y'all, please know that you are in our prayers as you start this new school year, as well as all parents who are also readjusting to those new schedules. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself for us an offering and sacrifice to God.
The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For by water and the Holy Spirit, you have made us a new people in Jesus Christ our Lord to show forth your glory in all the world. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. And gracious Father, in your infinite love you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you in your mercy sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread. And when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many, for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son, the holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him. In the unity of the Holy Spirit, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
the gifts of God for the people of God.
send you forth bearing these holy gifts that those to whom you go may share with us in the communion of Christ's body and blood. We, who are many, are one body because we all share in bread and one cup. Let us pray. Almighty and ever-living God, we thank you for feeding us with the spiritual food of the most precious body and blood of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, and for assuring us in these holy mysteries that we are living members of the body of your Son and heirs of your eternal kingdom. And now, Father, send us out to do the work you have given us to do, to love and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. To him, to you, and to the Holy Spirit, be honor and glory, now and forever. Amen. The peace of God which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. in peace to love and serve the Lord.